thanks for joining us today, everybody. I will talk a little bit about Crystal's presentation for you entitled Understanding the Crunch, a deep dive into cheese crystals. On the left there, you can see uh, Dr. Paul Kinstead, sort of my mentor in the cheese world as of late. I'm on the right there being overrun by a, by a flock or herd of goats, a great little goat farm here in Vermont. And uh, as we approach the end of the webinar, you know, in the next 50, 55 minutes, feel free to type in the chat box some interesting questions or anything that I may have flubbed or garbled when you were trying to understand it. Okay, we'll dive right in. Um, here's just, I want to give a little overview of sort of the research team we have here in Vermont. I'm one part of a whole team. Uh, looking at crystals more as of late I've picked up most of the reins of the research but we also have a lot of collaborators we'd like to talk about. All the way on the left there that's Professor John Hughes he's a world-renowned mineralogist and x-ray diffractometry expert so he knows crystals a lot doesn't have much cheese or dairy knowledge but if there's finding crystals he's the guy you want. Uh, he's actually most famous he looked at uh, minerals in the moon rocks from Apollo landing so that's that's pretty cool. In the center of that picture on the left there that's Dr. Gil Tansman, he laid the foundation for a lot of this work. He now works at a, a creamery uh, here in Vermont full time. He's moved on. On the right here, this is Dr. Paul Kinstead, sort of, you know, one of the rock stars in the cheese world. Uh, and here's a picture of me. Uh, I'm Pat again. Uh, some names on here, some previous uh, sort of people that have been with the university that helped with crystals but have moved on to other things. Uh, some work for companies like Lactalis or that kind of idea. Um, and a little bit about me, a shameless plug, I run a website called cheesescience.org, uh, which you're welcome to check out anytime. It's not affiliated with the university, it's sort of my own thing, creating scientific cheese information for the world to consume. Okay, enough about the people, let's, let's dive into more of the research and crystals and their, their great relationship with cheese. Uh, I won't read through these, but you have a copy of this. Feel free to look up any of these papers if you want more information. And you can always contact me if you don't have access. I can send you some of these if you're ever curious about sort of more of the nitty gritty science we do and some of the results we, we've published in the past. Okay, now let's dive into the, the core information. Uh, before we dive into the chemistry and the formation of crystals, just a quick overview of where we'll be going. Uh, we'll be talking about calcium lactate and how it's formed in cheese, uh, mostly in cheddar, right? But um, every day, every day, I look at more and more cheeses. I can actually find calcium lactate in other cheeses as well. But cheddar will be the focus for our talks, just an introduction. Then we have the amino acid crystals, tyrosine and leucine, which are very common in your, your Parmigiano-Reggiano types, your Gruyere, H. Gouda's, those kinds of cheeses. And then we have calcium phosphate. Uh, one form of that's called brushate, and we'll talk more about that, you know, ad nauseum as the day goes on. That's found across a whole wide variety of cheeses, since calcium and phosphate are so plentiful in milk. And then finally, sort of the, I don't want to call them the, the weird kids, but Eichheit and Struvite are some of the more recently discovered crystals on, found on the surfaces of washed rind cheese, which are, uh, you know, responsible for that gritty sensation sometimes you get with, you know, Limburger styles or any of the soft washed rind bacterial surface ripened cheeses. And over here we have some pictures. Yeah, this is actually a block of 20 year old cheddar here uh, that has some crystals form on it. Aged gouda with crystals in the eyes, very, very common. Some inclusions within the body as well, maybe where there are some mechanical openings. Uh, this, this white crystal here, this is a crystal of eichite, which is a calcium carbonate type. And over here, this is a struvite, which is a magnesium ammonium phosphate type. And we'll, uh, we'll go into more detail about all these soon. So don't feel like you need to to see more pictures and more chemistry as we go on. So before we talk about cheese crystals, let's first talk about what exactly is a crystal. Quite simply, a crystal is any material that has a, re has a repeating microscopic structure. Another word of saying that is it's highly ordered. And that ordering means we can use certain techniques to analyze it much clearer and much better than say an amorphous background, which is exactly what cheese is. Cheese itself doesn't have much order, especially microscopically, it's a hodgepodge of proteins, fats, lactose, moisture, that kind of stuff. Crystals stand out because they have a highly ordered repeating structure. And all these pictures here on this slide are actually pictures we've taken from cheese. These are each and every one of these are real cheese crystal pictures. Uh, some of them have filters applied, 
crystals aren't normally rainbows, those are pretty obvious, but this is how they look, shape and size-wise, across the whole world. And we'll talk about more of these in just a bit. So let's talk about how can you find crystals? You can. There's many different ways of finding crystals. You can find them in some ways and in other ways. Let's first talk about what the lack of crystals are. That's called amorphous. Again, this means there's no microscopic order. This is what cheese is, more or less. The fat, the proteins I talked about, has no long-term order microscopically. So that means you can't use certain techniques to pick it up. But when you do find a crystal in there, it stands out very easily. It allows us to analyze it. Right, and from a consumer point of view, from a macroscopic point of view, you know, crunchiness is probably the one we think about mostly. Cheese isn't crunchy, the crystals are crunchy. Then we have what's called our polycrystals, or many crystals, that's what that means. These are a bunch of crystals that sort of merge together and sort of form a large sheeting or large clump of crystals. Calcium lactate on cheddar is a good example of this. And the tyrosine and leucine and uh, parmesan and gouda is another good example. Because those aren't just pure crystals. They're crystals that are sort of rammed together. There may be a little fat in there, a little protein in there, right? And then there's finally single crystals. And I call this global order because the whole thing is a crystal and just a crystal. There's no embedded fat, no embedded protein. It's literally just a single crystal. Think of it as like how you think of a single grain of salt, right? Finding that in cheese. Pretty interesting, but it's not just salt. There's so many other more crystals in the cheese world. And I maybe I should point out right now that uh, for this talk, we're only talking about crystals you find in natural cheeses, meaning non-processed cheeses. When you start adding emulsifying salts to processed cheese, you can get all sorts of other crystals form as well. We're just gonna look at the non-processed cheeses today. So just, I like visuals. I like to make animations of PowerPoint. By the day's end, you might get tired of them a little bit. But this is sort of how you can imagine an amorphous order. Right, all those blocks, all these little spheres could be molecules or atoms or something like that. Uh, and amorphous, there's no order overall, it just sort of looks like randomness. When we move on to what's called a polycrystal, you can start to see certain regional order. Right, there's a clump over here that's ordered, there's a clump over here that's ordered. Overall, they're still randomly shoved together, but there's regions of order within that. And then finally, we have the single crystal, like I talked about. This is the grain of salt. When you look at it, through and through, it's all perfectly ordered structure, right? And we, and we find all three of these types in cheese. We find single crystals, polycrystals, and of course, cheese itself, the background is amorphous. So let's talk about crystal aggregates. This is how polycrystals are formed, sort of, and this is how where most crystals fall in the cheese world. So we start with what's called crystal nucleation. This can be caused by many things, maybe an opening in the body, a mechanical opening in the cheese body, a loose packaging film on the surface of a cheddar, something like that. But a spot is there that allows crystals to nucleate or to start growing, that's what that means. So pretend these are our nucleation points and the crystals will start to grow, grow, you know, they'll get bigger and bigger as time goes on. And the idea here is, the crystals grow, they're gonna lose their individual identity, meaning they're gonna to merge together in a crystal aggregate, sort of like the polycrystal we'll be talking about earlier. And you see this in a lot of different cheeses. Cheddar is probably the most famous when you look at the surface. And if you look closely, this is sort of what it would look like, right? You can see some single crystals here sort of sticking out, but you can also see how they merge together in sort of just like a solid uh, sheet or sort of a haze that forms over the surface. Really common in cheddar and other cheeses as well. Here's just a little video of uh, an ingredient called alum, A-L-U-M. It's not in cheese, it's you can buy it, you make pickles out of it actually. But I wanted to sort of give it like a real-time view of how crystals grow and merge together. This is actually a real-time video uh, under our microscope of how these crystals grow really fast. Cheese crystals grow much slower, but this is to give the idea of, you know, you have single crystals merging into sort of a big clump of crystals that can be viewed by the naked eye on the surface of a cheese. Okay, now I've understood a little bit about what crystals are, how they grow a little bit. Let's start applying that knowledge to cheese itself and the whole cheese spectrum. So let's, I'm gonna form a little bit of a family tree of crystals. And we're gonna start at the top sort of with the great grandparents, right? We have mineral-based crystals, and we have amino acid-based crystals. And from there, we're gonna branch out and sort of explore all of the known crystal types there are so far. Under the mineral base heading, we have crystals that are based off the mineral calcium. 
And we also have crystals based off the mineral magnesium. These are the two main families of crystals we found thus far. And that doesn't mean there's other minerals of crystals that might be out there in cheese so far. These are just the ones we know about at this point. And over in the amino acid world, tyrosine and leucine are the big players as far as crystals and cheese. And I put a little question mark there because there's some literature in the past that might refer to this sort of haphazardly. There might be a different one, maybe cysteine, but more research needs to be done to see if you can actually find other amino acid crystals in cheese. Under the calcium heading, we have calcium lactate crystals, very common in cheddar. But we can get even more specific than that. We can talk about the L form of calcium lactate or the DL form of calcium lactate. Uh, we'll talk more about what those differences are. These are what are called enantiomers or enantiomeric forms. And different things cause them. And you know, DL form, for example, is much more likely to form a crystal than the L form. We'll talk about why that is in just a bit. Also, under the calcium-based crystal heading, we have calcium phosphate. As we all know, calcium and phosphate are sort of the main components of milk and cheese at this point, mineral components. So we'd expect to find those crystals. But again, we find certain forms of calcium phosphate. So far, the main form we found has been brushite, which is just a, happens to be a different, you know, two calcium and phosphate thrown together to form brushite crystals. We'll talk about where you can find those in the cheese world. And then finally, calcium carbonate. And this is a pretty interesting crystal as well. Here we found this in a few different forms so far. We found calcite, eichite so far, but we're, sh we're thinking you can find other forms of it out in the cheese world so as well. Under magnesium, we found a magnesium ammonium phosphate crystal. Um, this crystal, along with the carbonate-based crystals, are so far only found on the surface of soft wash rind cheeses. Pretty interesting. So let's dive in and talk about where each of these components come from in the cheese world. So the idea by understanding the chemistry of how they form, you can sort of predict what cheeses you find them in. Calcium, pretty obvious. Don't want to sound patronizing, but it's very plentiful in milk and cheese. I like to think of it as the glue that holds casein together. This is sort of a cartoon diagram of a cheese structure. The blue sphere is representing casein matrix, the protein matrix holding the cheese together. If you zoom into that and look at it, you'll see that calcium, a yeah, large part, what's called colloidal calcium phosphate, is holding the structure together. And there's free calcium floating around too, and that interaction's important. We probably won't have time to get in today, but it's very important for how crystals form. Okay, moving on. Where do we find lactate? Lactate is just a fancy word for lactic acid, sort of just the deprotonated acid. No need to get more chemically technical than that. It's formed by the starter culture. Starter cultures will consume the lactose, the milk sugar, break it down to lactic acid. This is called you know, fermentation, glycolysis, all sorts of things. This is one of the first steps of cheese making. And almost every common cheese nowadays, especially the ones with crystals, are going to have this step going on to some degree or another. Okay, moving on from there, where do we find phosphate? Like I said earlier, calcium. Specifically, calcium phosphate is the glue that holds cheese together. So sort of where you find calcium, you're likely to find phosphate. Again, in the casein matrix of the cheese, or if it's been dissolved out, free to move and react and form crystals, like we'll talk about. How about carbonate? Carbonate is just the word you use when carbon dioxide, the gas, is dissolved in liquid. In this case, the water phase of the cheese on the surface. And where do we get carbon dioxide from? In the case of uh, surface ripened cheeses like you know, soft wash rind cheeses like Limburger or you know, Munster, those kinds of cheeses, uh, smear microbes will consume that lactic acid we talked about. And one of the byproducts of that metabolism is the formation of carbon dioxide. And that can build up to some, to, to quite the degree in the ripening space, in the, in the affinage, in the cave, in the, the cabinet, wherever you're ripening these cheeses. So much so that it can crystallize out when calcium is present, as we'll talk about. Okay, we've talked about calcium based crystals and where those pieces come from. Let's move into magnesium. Magnesium can be found in a similar place in milk that calcium can, just to a lot smaller amount. Magnesium is also part of the casein micelle, just to a much lower amount, and we'll talk about that in a second. But it can be introduced to other places as well. If you have exceptionally hard water, magnesium can be present there. Some salts can have high 
amounts of magnesium, especially if they happen to be sea salts, which are notorious for their mineral content aside from the sodium chloride. Okay, moving on. Let's sort of look at an overview of how minerals are situated in milk and try to understand why we get certain crystals from certain minerals, but not from others. If you look at this graph here, on the x-axis, we have the different mineral types in milk. This is the total mineral content. So this is if you take a glass of milk and analyze it, this is what you'd get. And on the y-axis, we have amounts. The units here aren't so important. It's in milligrams per 100 grams of milk. What's important to see is that these are the main minerals you find. And just here's a table numerically showing that. The first thing that stands out is that the number one mineral in milk is actually potassium, more so than calcium even. And you also have phosphorus, sodium, and magnesium. So it's important to point out why is it that we only get minerals from calcium, phosphorus, or phosphate, and magnesium? If potassium is so plentiful, why aren't you finding those crystals all about in the cheese world? It's because of where these minerals are situated. When you make cheese and you drain off the whey, soluble minerals will be lost. And as we'll see in a second, some of these minerals are much more soluble than the others. They're not trapped into the casein matrix. So for example, now we're looking at the insoluble mineral, mineral content of milk. Another way of thinking about this is the mineral content of cheese. So all the soluble minerals, most of them would be drained out in the way. We're sort of gonna ignore sodium because we add a bunch of sodium when we add salt. But it's, what's important to look here is that calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium all will remain in cheese to some degree or another because they're insoluble in the first place. So looking up at this table, just summing everything up, these are the main three minerals that are sort of carried throughout the cheese making process that can form crystals. You don't find many potassium crystals because, well, there's just no potassium there at that point. It's all been lost in the way. And you know, there's technical reasons why we don't find sodium chloride crystals in cheese. One thing, it's very soluble. And those sort of don't count anyway, since we're adding salt anyway. Okay, let's move back to our family tree here and sort of finish it out. So we talk about minerals, we talk about magnesium. One crystal we find, magnesium ammonium phosphate. Where is that coming from? Again, ammonium is just the word we use for when ammonia is dissolved in water. And I think anyone who spent any time in a cheese aging or ripening space knows ammonia is very plentiful across the world of cheeses. If there's any surface ripening, any surface microbiological happenings going on, you'll find ammonia, right? And that's just be, mostly, be, mostly because of the the smear bacteria, the surface bacteria, breaking down protein and releasing ammonia into the ripening atmosphere. And this one's pretty easy to pick up. You smell it, you know what's there. It's gonna dissolve into everything that's there, into your clothing, into the wood, into the surface of the cheese more or less a little bit. And there it can help form crystals. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. Okay, so we've looked at the mineral-based crystals on the left side here, so that side of the family tree. Let's move on to the other side, the amino acid side of things. Um, pretty important crystals, but these sort of have a more of an organic biological sort of focus because they're not made of just you know, minerals or basically little rocks. That's what I like to think minerals of. Tyrosine and leucine, these are both amino acids. Amino acids are the things that build proteins. So as the protein in the cheese breaks down over time or through microbiological action, you'll get amino acids that form. And as amino acids form, they'll get higher and higher amounts. So high sometimes, you know, they'll crystallize out. There's, there's, not, there's not enough water in that cheese to hold all these amino acids, they'll form a crystal. And that's what this slide is trying to show, more or less. Um, here I just grabbed some data from a couple different scientific papers to sort of show what's going on and why certain amino acids are pretty prevalent in cheese, others not so much. On the, on the x-axis here, we have different amino acids. The ones important for us are tyrosine, this TYR, and leucine, LEU. Again, on the y-axis, we have amount, not so important here. That's what these green bars are showing, the amounts of amino acids. What's important to us here is this yellow bar here, which means solubility. So here, if you find any green bar that goes above that yellow, that yellow dash, it means it's above its solubility point. It will crystallize out. So for example, this study in Parmesan cheese found that tyrosine and leucine are above that solubility, they'll form crystals. 
And it, what's pretty interesting here is tyrosine is actually one of the least amount of amino acids you find in the cheese world, especially in this study, in Parmesan cheese. So there's very little free tyrosine there. What's important though is that its solubility is really low as well. So even though there's a tiny amount there, it's still above its solubility point, it will crystallize out. And that's sort of the point I'm trying to make here because the most, when people first learn that tyrosine is found in such low amounts, they wonder, well, why, why is it there if it's in low amounts? Why does it crystallize out? It's because the solubility is exceptionally low. And there's other amino acids here that you know, are important for cheese for many other reasons, but our focus is on tyrosine and leucine because those are the crystals we found so far. Driving home the point, tyrosine and leucine, some of them may be in small amounts, but their solubility is so low that as soon as they're formed in cheese, they'll crystallize right out of there. And that's the tree, that's the family tree. We sort of, in natural cheese, non-processed cheese, this is the crystals we found so far, especially, and this is the Kinstead lab personally. All the people may have found crystals, they haven't published about them yet, so if you have any inside information there, let us know, that'd be great to learn about. But what's really interesting is how a lot of these are sort of relatively recent. If you look about five years ago, this was the crystal landscape, more or less. These are the crystals we knew about, more or less, as far as in the published literature in the science world. So we've made a lot of headway in the last five years, and we hope this tree will be even more plentiful five years to come. I figure now is a good time to mention this. Um, we'll dive into each of these more, but this is a little handout. Um, you can go to this URL. You have the handout. You can go to that URL and download it. Um, it's, it's in a PDF. It just talks about the main crystal types, where you find them, a picture of each, a little bit of uh, the chemistry, the chemical structure and formula. Right, and you know, you can, you can hang this up on the refrigerator, sleep with it on your bedside at night, right? It'll put you to sleep more or less. It, it, it's, and uh, it, printing in black and white doesn't turn out so well, we discovered that. So maybe it's best to keep it on the screen. Okay, so how do we actually find crystals in cheese? I talked about earlier, crystals have a unique structure that makes them easy to find. Well, how are we taking advantage of that? One of the main methods we use is what's called PXRD, powder x-ray diffractometry. Uh, this is a pretty common method in other areas of science, especially in geology or mineralogy where they study crystals all the time. It's been used to limited amounts in food as well. And really until our group started, it wasn't used much for cheese crystal identification more than trying to find a defective cheese here or there. And now we've sort of systematically been looking at every possible crystal we can find across all cheese varieties. And we really tailor down this technique to be pretty powerful to pick up different crystal types. So on the left here is what the machine actually looks like. You put a little slide here where the sticker is and you sort of blast it with x-rays. And since crystals have a unique repeating structure, they'll interact with x-rays in certain ways and you get what's called over here a diffractogram. And you can look this up based off of previous data and see what does it match. This sort of is the fingerprint that we compare to try to find what crystals are. At the top here is a diffractogram of some Roquefort cheese from France and you can sort of see the crystal peaks there, these, we call these peaks. And these are unique to the type of crystal. So if it has peaks in a certain arrangement at a certain height, we're like, okay, it has crystals X, Y, and Z. We'll talk more about this in a bit. And down here, this is an example of a uh, Emmental cheese from Switzerland. And again, we see certain peaks and you see these different colors here sort of correlate to the different crystals. So there's different types of crystals in these cheeses. This allows us to pick up not only if there's crystals, but what kind, and even if there's multiple kinds. Pretty cool. And then sort of to the other side of things, we have x-ray, and then we also have what's called polarized light microscopy. Uh, polarized light microscopy is just a fancy way of altering a microscope to sort of take advantage of crystalline nature. You can put certain filters on it to do certain things, like over here, the filters we've applied give it a purple background, and sort of color these crystals in unique ways, which can be very useful to differentiate them between certain types of crystals. And over here on the left, we have a crystal rotating around, and here we're analyzing what's called an angle of extinction. Again, when using polarized light, we can rotate these crystals, and you see they go extinct or transparent, like this one did here, at really prescribed angles. So this is another point of differentiation we can use to identify uh, how these crystals are used. And maybe it's just saying, what's the point of polarized light if we have x-rays? Well, a polarized light microscope is a lot less expensive, you know, a few grand compared to a few hundred thousand dollars. And also, speaking personally, I'm pretty big into science imagery. You can produce some really beautiful pictures, as we'll see in a second, as you saw earlier. I think not only for scientific purposes, but also for 
you know, marketing purposes. I would love if someone started putting pictures of these on their cheese products, right? I'll, I'll, I'll give away all the copyrights. If you guys want to put these on your cheeses, that'd be, that'd be great. I think these could be a really cool selling point of some products. Okay, enough of my personal opinions. Let's get back to the science. <laughs> okay, we're going to dive into the certain cheese types right now and sort of go slowly through the main cheese types and the crystals we can find in them. So we're going to start with cheddar. And of course, with cheddar, we have calcium lactate. Uh, the actual name, we say calcium lactate crystals, but it's usually a certain form of calcium lactate we find in cheese, which is called calcium lactate pentahydrate. Uh, the pentahydrate means there's just five water molecules sort of floating around this crystal structure, which is important because with that water molecule, if that goes away, it's altered in some way and makes it you get a different form. It's harder to analyze with our techniques. So what makes up calcium lactate pentahydrate? As I already said, pentahydrate, five waters. But more importantly for our discussion, uh, you have two lactic acid moieties, parts. That's what these are. And then you have a calcium ion right in the middle, sort of holding everything together. That's really how you find calcium lactate in cheddar. And we can get more specific. If you haven't noticed by this point, every time I mention a crystal type, I always say, oh, there's a different form. And then of those forms, there's different forms. And the same story is with calcium lactate. As you saw earlier in that family tree, it can form in two possible ways so far in cheese that we've discovered. Um, we have what's called L calcium lactate pentahydrate. That's what CLP stands for. And this is made up of what's called L lactate. And we also have DL, a mixture of both the L form that we talked about and the D form, sort of a 50-50 mix of calcium lactate pentahydrate. And again, this is made up of both the L form of lactate and the D form of lactate. Um, to understand the difference between L and D, it's really just sort of a lot of, you know, it's a little esoteric if you dive into the, the organic chemistry. What's important though to know is that these molecules live in three dimensions, not just pictures on a screen. And certain parts, they can be made up of the same pieces, but those pieces can be arranged in different ways. And that's sort of what D and L and L sort of look at. And so, so those pieces can be arranged in different ways. That means they can come together in different ways, form crystals in different ways, maybe form crystals more readily. Hint, hint, a little spoiler alert there, what we're gonna be talking about. So let's look at the formation of calcium lactate crystals and sort of how step-by-step step, how they get to be formed in a cheddar cheese, for example. So for example, here we have lactic acid. Here's a structure of lactic acid. Well, what makes an acid an acid actually is this little group over here, the carboxylic acid. Again, this came from the starter culture activity in the cheese. It broke down the lactose and formed this. And you get enough of these to form in the presence of calcium. This is sort of what you get, again, sort of just covers what we talked about in the last slide, but in a different way. Uh, you have acid being formed, and we don't go into the chemistry too much here, but a function of acid in cheese, aside from the flavor, aside from the microbiological safety, is it sort of affects the mineral balance in cheese. Just like the acid in soda dissolves calcium from your teeth, the acid in cheese dissolves calcium from its structure. So you get more free calcium forms as acids produced. And so this sort of forms a positive feedback loop. You have acid being formed by the starter culture, that acid's creating free calcium in the cheese. You get enough of both happening, reach the solubility point, maybe you find a nucleation site, loose packaging, a kind of opening in the cheese body. You'll get this to be formed, calcium lactate pentahydrate. And again, I already showed you this picture. This is sort of a, an extreme case of what that would look like in a cheddar cheese. So how do we get there? I mentioned there's L-lactate and DL-lactate. Well, let's go step by step. Start with lactose in your milk, right? You're gonna add your starter culture. As you already said, I like to repeat myself if you can't tell by now. You're gonna form mostly L-lactate. This is, so now we're getting a little more specific. So starter cultures form a certain form of lactate, L-lactate, and this is, not a hard, fast rule. You might be using some crazy starter cultures that might do certain things, but on the whole, in traditional cheddar manufacture, you're only forming really one form of lactate when you're using starter culture. It's called L-lactate. And that'd be important for a second, as we'll discuss. But it doesn't stop there, right? Starter cultures form lactate, but you can also have non-starters available. That's what NSLAB stands for, non-starter lactic acid bacteria. 
So these are lactic acid bacteria that aren't part of your starter mix. They're sort of present elsewhere in the natural flora. Someone's sweating into the vat, who knows? But these are the non-starters we're concerned with. Here, these can actually sort of change the form of lactate. Uh, again, like I said, rearrange its structure a bit and form what's called DL lactate. Again, that's what the squiggly line is trying to show is that now this, this piece of that molecule here is now sort of in a different orientation than it was before. And this has dramatic effects on crystal formation. And it all has to do with solubility. So L-calcium lactate pentahydrate, L-CLP, is very soluble. So to recap, the lactate you get from starter culture is very soluble, meaning it's very, it doesn't like to form crystals. If it's very soluble, it means a lot of it can be around without crystals being formed. But if your non-starters get a hold of it and form DL lactate, it becomes very insoluble. Right, just that little piece of the little movement of that molecule makes it very insoluble. Now it's very prone to crystallization. Right, and this is usually the type we see on cheeses, you know, again and again. We see this cheese a lot because how insoluble it is. You can find L calcium lactate pentahydrate in cheddar cheese, and we do, but you have to have it in extreme amounts. Uh, DL calcium lactate pentahydrate, you don't need nearly as much, and it'll form crystals in a snap, really. So what do calcium lactate pentahydrate crystals look like on a cheddar cheese and where can you find them? Um, I started in this slide, I want to sort of address a big misnomer too. So this may look familiar, right? Most consumers would say that's mold, but we know better. We know those are cheese crystals, calcium lactate. They can form what's called distinct crystals. We sort of alluded to this earlier about how crystals form uh, polycrystals. So it forms distinct crystals. You can sort of see this little dot here and sort of spattered throughout this piece of cheese. Crystal aggregates, as we talked about earlier. Here, the single crystal sort of grew together to form these crystal aggregates, as we talked about. And then you, this might be the other form you see. This is probably the most common way you see it on a piece of cheese, especially on the outside. It doesn't sort of look as big and blocky and chunky as that previous picture. Here, it forms sort of a haze, a diffuse haze. Here, if you zoom in really, really close, you'll see distinct crystals like this. They're just much smaller. And that's sort of the unwritten rule in crystal work across the whole food world, right? If you get, if you get smaller crystals and more of them, they'll look like this. You get bigger crystals and less of them, they'll form these big chunks that we saw up here. And then finally, you can also find calcium lactate crystals internally embedded in cheddar cheeses, which is sort of the, you know, you go online and start looking about what cheese crystal is what. This is sort of the biggest misnomer I see is that calcium lactate and cheddar is only on the outside. Most likely it's only on the outside, right? But you can also find it inside. We find calcium lactate inside of cheddar cheese all the time. And there's many different reasons for that. A lot of times it's because of that non-starter activity I talked about earlier, or you have extreme amounts of minerals and lactic acid being formed. Maybe you fortified your milk or you had too much acid development, all sorts of things combined with the non-starters. You can get crystal aggregates on the inside. That's actually a fun fact that sort of kicked off the research here was looking at uh, certain producers, why they get these big calcium lactate inclusions in their cheese. Pretty interesting nonetheless. It has to be sort of dangerous too, because especially the insoluble form of this can get very hard. And you know, we, we like the crunch in uh, Parmesan cheese, but these can get so hard that people might think they're foreign objects. And that's, that's the danger here is trying to educate people that it's not glass in the cheese, it's the natural components of cheese forming crystals. Okay, we talked about cheddar cheese. Now let's move on to some soft surface ripened cheeses, kinds of crystals we can find there. So let's first talk about bloomy rind cheeses. There's all sorts of crystals you can find in, in bloomy rind cheeses. And by all sorts, I mean one, brushite. <laughs> we hope they're all sorts. These are the only ones we found so far. Uh, brushite, here's the formula for it. It's calcium hydrogen phosphate dihydrate. This hydrated part is very common across the crystalline word. For our purposes, we can mostly ignore it. If we break this down though, we can sort of see where everything's coming from. Uh, the main parts here, we have calcium, and again, the PO4, that's a phosphate. So here's that calcium phosphate we talked about. The most, some of the most common minerals in cheese, uh, they build up to certain amounts, so you can get these crystals being formed. Pretty cool stuff. On the left here is an X-ray diffractogram of what brushite would look like in a cheese. It's sort of highlighted here. This is from a camembert cheese produced here in the States. 
I guess I should say Camembert style cheese produced here in the United States. And over here is under a microscope. This is sort of what we think these crystals look like. You can sort of see these, these aren't what you call those single crystals anymore. These aren't these sort of little chunks of salt. These are much what we say poorer quality crystals. These are sort of polycrystals, hodgepodge of crystals thrown together. And we sort of have some ideas of what's going on there. But what's important to understand with these is these are a crucial part, and sort of outside the scope of this talk, a crucial part of the softening process, we think, for uh, white mold cheeses like Brie or Camembert. All right, especially, you know, the traditional style versus, you know, sort of the modified make style to make stabilized. All right, if you think about how a Camembert softens from the outside inward, right, you know, the, the old prevailing knowledge was, oh, it's just the molds producing proteases that break down the protein and works its way in. Uh, we now know that's not the whole picture. That's a very small portion of it. You know, acid development and acid metabolism is a big part of it. That pH change is a big part of it. And crystal formation is a big part of it. Since these calcium and phosphate are being used up by these crystals on the surface where the mold's growing, they've sort of pulled it out of the cheese body more or less. And since calcium and phosphate are the glue that hold cheese together, um, the cheese can get softer because those crystals have been ripped out of there and are sitting on the surface in crystalline form. So this forms a really crucial part of the, the cheese softening, made, cheese softening uh, paradigm, really. Pretty cool stuff. And we have some papers published. I, I'll, uh, in order in the slides, I link to them, uh, where we actually track the migration of calcium and phosphate as a cheese ripens, and it's pretty interesting. It moves toward a surface, like we talked about. Okay, so another surface ripened cheese we'll talk about are soft wash rind cheeses. So your Munster types, your Limburger types, a plus, those kinds of things. And here, and these are the most new crystals we've discovered in cheese so far. We have what's called eichite and struvite. Eichite, let's break it down. Here's that calcium carbonate and then hexahydrate, six water molecules. We'll ignore the six water molecules for now. Calcium, very prevalent in cheese, makes sense. Here's that carbonate we talked about earlier. This is dissolved carbon dioxide. And again, that carbon dioxide comes from the smear bacteria breaking down lactic acid. So again, it's a natural part of the cheese ripening process. I'll move over to struvite over here on the right. Let's break this one down. Magnesium, ammonium, phosphate. Uh, magnesium, like I said, is found in milk and cheese to a lesser degree than calcium, but it is there in the casein micelle. Uh, we have ammonium, which is just the dissolved form of ammonia, which again is very prevalent in surface ripened cheeses. And then finally, we have phosphate which again, will follow basically what calcium is in the cheese body. So the point I really wanna make with this is that all these pieces, they may look like chem complex chemical, you know, sort of labs going on the surface of cheeses. It's pretty cool you can trace back where all these pieces come from and sort of how you got there. It's pretty cool stuff. And here are just sort of the, the pictures down here are sort of the structures you'd see if you're able to zoom in with a high power microscope and see where the atoms are actually arranged. It's, it's pretty cool. Over here, you can sort of see calcium being surrounded by carbon dioxide and water. And on the right here, you can see magnesium being surrounded by ammonia and phosphate. Pretty cool stuff. Again, it's more of a macroscopic view. This is sort of what eichite crystals look like under polarized light. And they actually look very similar. If you, uh, you can get some cheeses, you actually can rinse off the crystals and look at them with the naked eye. This is how big these can get. Pretty cool. And then over here, we have struvite. And this is what struvite would look like under polarized light. Um, without polarized light, they're just sort of perfectly transparent like some of these guys are. These are pretty small. These, unless they grow to extreme sizes, which I've only seen in a few cheeses, you can't see with the naked eye. So, and you know, our, our supposition is that you also can't feel them with your, with your mouth or tongue either, that the eye kite are the ones that are big enough to cause the sensory response. And here's just a little video I shot of a piece of wash rind cheese produced here in Vermont in the United States. And I want you to pay attention as the camera moves around, you see little pinpricks of light, little sparkles that sort of shimmer as the camera's being moved around. And those are the crystals. Those are, we're pretty sure, the eye kite crystals. They get so big, you're seeing them with your naked eye. Right, and this is sort of the part of the talk where I say, people, a lot of people ask, is it a defect or is it or is it you know, a desirable trait? And I have to say it depends, right? For many years and still in some parts, calcium lactate and cheddar, depending on your in institution, depending on your company, it's still a defect. But you know, in the artisan cheese circles now, crystals are becoming you know, 
one of the coolest parts of the eating experience is people love the crunch in aged Gouda, aged Gouda, and Parmesan. My hope is with enough education, enough of this sort of outreach and sort of making it cool, that we can make the grittiness you find in wash rind cheese surfaces to be cool as well. I'm not sure if that's the case. I personally don't like gritty wash rind cheeses, but at least we know what they are now. That's better than nothing. So this is just sort of summing up where we get those pieces of the wash rind crystals. Calcium, phosphate, and magnesium, they're, in, they're you know, endogenous into the milk and cheese itself, so they'll crystallize out. What's unique here is now we see the, the role of microbes playing an active part in the formation of crystals. Without the microbe metabolism, we wouldn't have the carbonate or the ammonium, the carbon dioxide or the ammonia to form these crystals. So here the microbes are adding a key component to form these crystals. And then finally, we have external sources, stuff we can't really control. A magnesium might be this case. If you're using a wacky sea salt on your cheese, or if your water is extremely hard, that can affect things as well. Or for some reason, you your milk has a high magnesium content, who knows? Again, if you can't tell, this is my favorite area of cheese crystals. So we're, we're gonna cover how these form, you know, ad nauseum. You have these pieces being part of the cheese body, your calcium, your magnesium, your phosphate, right? And then from the smear, the smear is sort of that, you know, the gloopy layer on the surface where the bacteria are growing, living and thriving, consuming the lactic acid, they form carbon dioxide and ammonia. All these pieces sort of dissolve back into the smear. There's enough CO2 in the atmosphere to seep into everything. Same with ammonia, forms of carbonate and ammonium like we talked about. I already talked about earlier how minerals migrate to the surface of cheese. The same thing happens on washed rind cheese as happens in bloomy rind cheeses. We've published a paper, I think it just came out earlier this year actually, that shows it does back work. Bacteria sort of do the same things that molds do as far as set up these concentration gradients. And you get these here and the pieces are all there. The pieces are present, they'll form these crystals. And these are another picture of sort of what they would look like on a cheese surface. Again, they'd be transparent. They wouldn't be blue like this. It's just a, a filter we use. So here you can actually see them, what we say in situ in science. You can see them as they lie on the surface of cheese. Right, so this is the surface of a uh, wash rind cheese actually produced here in Vermont again. And you sort of see there's these little pittings all over the surface. Don't let those bother you. That's just from the, the paper they wrap the cheese with. Uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph of the cheese surface. But if you look closely, you can see sort of these big you know, rocks or hunks sort of embedded in the surface. Uh, here's an easy one to see right here. All right, if we zoom in, this is sort of what it looks like. Right, and, and the scale bar is set for 50 micrograms. And that may seem like, wow, it's so small. This crystal, if I plucked it off and put it on a tip of a needle, you could actually see it. This is visible under the naked eye. It's just hard to resolve because it's so small. But we think this is an eikite crystal sort of embedded in the smear, right? So that, that goopy surface where the bacteria are growing and thriving, the crystal is sort of forming right there and sort of are embedded in the surface. And I always like to ask people when they look at this, without knowing any background, if I didn't say it was the surface of a cheese, what does it look like? And the number one answer I get, and it, it just fills my heart with joy, is that, oh, it looks like a lunar landscape, and I couldn't agree more. I'm a pretty big amateur astronomy person, and this does look like a really cool picture of a you know, barren landscape somewhere in the solar system. But it's right here on the surfaces of our cheese. It, it's pretty cool. Okay, we talked about cheddar, we talked about surface ripened cheeses. Let's move on to some blue cheese. And there was a method to the madness of the order I'm going with how we're describing these cheeses, and we'll talk about it in a second. So these are the crystals we can find in blue cheeses so far. These are the ones we've identified personally in our work. Uh, we've found tyrosine, which is the amino acid we talked about, leucine, another amino acid, and then brushite, a similar crystal to the ones we find in the, the bloomy rind, like a brie or camembert. And here are all their, their chemical structures down here. This is brushite, uh, leucine, tyrosine, pretty interesting. Uh, if you look closely, uh, here's at this center picture here, you'll see these little white dots where the mold's growing, where the veins are, right, and sort of in the mechanical openings of the cheese. And that's really important. So I haven't mentioned this so far, but I'll say it again, that you need places for these components to sort of mix together. So openness in the body is very important for many of these crystals, especially ones that are sort of mineral-based, like brushite. And then the tyrosine and leucine, those are being formed by a different way, right? We've already talked about mold a little bit. Mold's very proteolytic. It likes to break down protein a lot. 
So as it breaks down the protein, tyrosine and leucine are formed, and that sort of causes them to crystallize out. Here's that same cheese sort of mashed together and filtered. This is how we'd analyze it. And here you can just see how chock full of crystals it really is. This is just like a, I say one of like say 100, 200 gram piece of cheese, absolutely full of crystals. This was a Roquefort from France. And again, we can use a microscope to analyze it too. That's sort of what these colorful little patches are here, are crystals. These sort of big blurry blobs or different crystals as well. Pretty cool stuff. But what's important here is that now we have sort of two competing things going on. We have mineral migration forming that brushite, and that has to do with how the pH changes over time, a little outside the scope of this talk of following the pH. But, and then you have protein breakdown. So you have protein breakdown with that change in acidity forming those mineral migration gradients. You get these types of crystals being formed. Very interesting stuff. Okay, let's dive into Italian grana cheeses now. So here's an example of one such cheese, Parmigiano Reggiano. Um, again, this is just the most famous example. Aside from cheddar, this is probably the cheese that has been most research done on it as far as crystal formation. If you look at the Italians, they've done a lot of research into this cheese since it is their bread and butter. Well, I guess it's their cheese, not their bread and butter. But they've done a lot of research to this. So there's plenty of information out there about these crystals. But I figure we present some of our personal studies. So when you look at a piece of Parm cheese, this is a wire cut piece of Parm. It's much easier to see crystals uh, when it's wired cut. And we'll talk about that in a second. That's actually pretty important to the whole eating experience. You see these really distinct white specks. And that's sort of what these arrows are pointing at. Well, and that's tyrosine, as we talked about before. Here's the sort of the x-ray fingerprint of tyrosine. That's what that looks like. And so you, you pick out those specks with a little spatula or dissection needle, you analyze them, this is what you get, tyrosine. Okay, we've seen tyrosine, makes sense. So as of late, more and more recently, you know, by recently, I mean in the last 10 years, we've, we've looked at other crystals in Parmesan as well. You sort of have these diffuse white circles sort of dis distributed throughout there. These aren't these distinct white specks anymore. We call these pearls. These are much sort of looser, not as hard as the tyrosine, much larger but you know, harder than the cheese body, but softer than the tyrosine itself. We were wondering, what is that? Is that tyrosine in a different form or is it a different crystal altogether? And it, we say, we think it's a different crystal altogether. We'd like to do more research before we say for sure what's going on, but we're pretty dang sure of it. And this is what this is trying to show that uh, if you scrape out the pearls, again, the pearls in Parmigiano Reggiano, those diffuse white spheres, this is the spectrum you get. And this is much different than tyrosine spectrum, more or less. And uh, we won't go into the specifics, but this peak right here, this big you know, mountain right here, in the literature, that's very characteristic of leucine. That's not to say it couldn't be caused by anything else, but everything else you've looked at, probably you won't find in cheese. I doubt there's very much cobalt or uranium in cheese. So, but leucine we know is very present in Parmesan cheese. So that, that's our best guess so far. And you can read some of our publications, we talk about it more, Italians do as well. And that's, and that's really important. So actually before, I, real quick before I move on, um, we talked about this a little bit, you know, these things form interruptions in the cheese body, they sort of break it up. So when you, instead of wire cutting parm, if you break it apart with a parm knife, they very naturally will fall along where these crystal boundaries are, because it's sort of a, a differentiation in cheese texture. So, when you see a nice piece of parm that's been cracked open with that nice bumpy ridge texture, a lot of times it's on the junction of crystals. So not only are crystals interesting from just chewing and crunching on them, uh, they can also have a, you know, an effect on how the cheese breaks down as far as cutting and serving, those kinds of things. Pretty cool. Okay, moving on to Dutch Gouda cheese. Uh, similar types of crystals. Don't mean to you know, give it away, but um, and you can sort of see them here. This is a piece of very old Gouda. This is a uh, three plus years. This is actually a picture of a cheese shop I used to work at when I lived in Wisconsin over here. And this is actually a display I built. I'm pretty proud of it, if you couldn't tell. I, I could use some work, but people love this. I have to say people, when they grab a piece of this kind of cheese, the first thing they talk about is how much they love, you know, we call them flavor crystals because I guess that's more consumer friendly, but we'll see in a second they're tyrosine. So here's an example of a picture of Gouda. Uh, very common if you look in the eyes of these cheeses to see the crystals. If you zoom in, this is what these crystals actually look like. People think they're sort of distinct hard like little rocks, 
but they're actually pretty fluffy when you go zoom into them. Doesn't mean they're not hard, but they actually are pretty, you know, fluffy, dispersed in a way. You zoom in even more, this is exactly what it looks like. I almost say those look like snowflakes, right? I, I think those are just beautiful. Imagine having a piece of that um, with a picture of that printed on the label. Oh my gosh, it would sell itself. That's, that's my argument. Or maybe, maybe not, I don't know, we'll see. And we see a different, we see a different morphology as well. We see, you know, snowflakes and we see these snowballs, I like to call them. So it's sort of, I guess maybe I shouldn't be using so many snow metaphors since you guys are in Australia, but it's snowing here right now. So <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, but the two different morphologies, the, sort of the flaky and sort of the more dense. And these are, this is its fingerprint, we look at it. We have, you know, our idea is maybe one, one of those morphologies is the tyrosine, these down here, maybe the, the snowballs, and then uh, the leucine peak over here, that probably, that might correlate to the, the fluffy snowflakes or vice versa, it's hard to know for sure. It, when you're dealing with the microscopic scale like this, it's very hard to pluck these out of each other and analyze them separately. We're working on it right now, but these are the main types of crystals you find in cheeses. And again, tyrosine and leucine, we saw it in parm, we'll see it in gouda. What do these cheeses have in common? They're very old, protein breaks down after a long time. In our experience, after about nine months, you can start to see these crystals being formed. And it, it is linked to the, the activity of a certain microbe, Lactobacillus helveticus. So if you ever eat like a sweet cheddar, a, a sweet cheddar, not your traditional cheddar, but a cheddar where you're adding Helveticus, that, that, uh, that microbe is very, very proteolytic. It loves to break down protein. And you know, part of its consequence of that metabolism is that sweet flavor that you get that sort of covers up bitterness, gives those sweet cheddars or pineapple flavors. Very common in aged gouda as well. But since they're so proteolytic, um, they can help form these crystals really well, not only in gouda cheese, but in cheddar cheese where you're adding them as well. So I say you find these in Gouda, and you say you find, you can also find them in cheddar as well if you're, if you're doing certain things to your cheese. Okay, let's move on to Alpine style cheeses a little bit. So here we have a Swiss cheese. Uh, we're going to look at tyrosine and brushite. Tyrosine again, very common. We've talked about it in Parmesan, we saw it in blue cheese, we saw it in aged Gouda. We also see it in Swiss cheeses. Over here, the picture of the right. Again, we sort of have two different morphologies we're seeing. We're seeing sort of embedded in the cheese body itself, and then also in the eye and the hole, we see, we see uh, crystals as well. And it's very common because I think anyone who's cut open a fresh piece of Swiss cheese will know this. In the eye, you often see liquid in there. And that liquid is really just like a, a nice little bubble bath for crystals, right? That liquid has all the dissolved components you would ever need for crystals. So as that liquid either seeps into the cheese or is evaporated away, that forms ultra concentrated solution that will crystallize out like this. Pretty cool stuff. You zoom in even more. Again, here we have those sort of those nice fluffy snowflakes like we talked about earlier, which we think are tyrosine. But then we have brushite, and this can be caused by a bunch of different reasons, right? Since calcium and phosphate are so common in this cheese, um, if you look at the acidification of Swiss cheese, right, it's not too acidified. So that could cause, you know, it's acidified, it may buffer back up, minerals may be dissolved, the pH goes back up a little bit will crystallize out because of solubility. A little beyond this, but so we're thinking it's a combination of protein being broken down and also sort of the acidification regimen of this cheese variety. Okay, thank you. I think I'm almost right on time. I try to make it 55 minutes. Okay, thanks everybody. We'll see if I can, I'll try to find the chat. That's all right, Pat, you can leave it like that. Okay. Oh. Yeah, so um, Pat, that was fantastic. And I just never knew what those yummy little crunch things were before. Um, I was fortunate to hear Pat in America in July speaking at the ACF's conference and um, he blew the audience away. So Pat, thank you for doing this at short notice. Um, now that handout on cheese crystals, that was emailed to you all. So you do have that. Um, and I'd also like to reinforce how good um, Pat's website is, cheesescience.org, and you can also show it to all your co-workers. It's a wonderful resource and highly recommend it if you want to learn specific things about cheese. Now, we're more than happy for people to chat, write questions into the chat box. Um, Pat would love a few questions to follow up on that. So please type in your questions. 
Right, take it away. Sure, so uh, this question's asking, uh, is the lack of brush shite and parm due to the cultures used or the affinage process? That is a great question. That actually is an outstanding sort of unanswered question we have. We think it might be a combination of two. So parm in theory should have brush shite because of its acidification regimen and because of just how, how dry it is in the end, it, it should form outside solubility range. Our idea might be that if you look at the body of a Parmesan, we usually only find brush shite where there's openness in the structure, mechanical openings or eyes. Parmesan usually has a pretty tight closed body. So we think, again, think is the word, we don't know for sure that it's sort of the making affinage process doesn't allow brush shite to be formed. Or it's just so overwhelmed by the tyrosine and leucine that we just haven't picked it up yet. That's, that's sort of our, our best guess so far. So, Pat, one of the things that I did learn in the States is people from the East Coast, for example, Point Reyes cheese, send their cheese to, oh, sorry, people from the West Coast send their cheese to the West Coast for affinage. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. cool. We're, we're trying to, you know, we're, we're uh, I don't want to say we're mimicking how the French do cheese, but I, I think it's pretty interesting that now we sort of have these affinage centers that will collect cheese from everyone or different producers and sort of age it to fruition. It, it's really cool. So, um, you know, and that um, situation there being by the sea on the West Coast produces a totally different result to what they would get on the East Coast of America. So that's something for people to think about here as well. Um, does anybody else have any, oh, here we go. If there's another question. Sure, so what are the main processing factors to adjust to create more or less calcium lactate and cheddar? Bacteria, pH, or both? Um, both is definitely the answer. There's different ways of doing this. Uh, we see sometimes you can even milk supply. With milk, if you increase the mineral content in your milk, if you're using a fortified milk, you know, you're you ultra filtering it, micro filtering your milk, that can cause it. If you have a lot of non-starter lactic acid bacteria around, so that can be either you're adding them I shouldn't say you're, you know, as an adjunct or just they're just indigenous to your environment. You can have lots of crystal formation potentially that way or pH as well. Um, if you get things very, very acidic, you get a lot of acid production. You have lots of lactate that have dissolved lots of calcium. You have those in very high amounts. They will crystallize out if, if the conditions are right. They need a nucleation point. You can't get the crystals to form the nucleation point. So if you, your cheese can be chock full of lactic acid and calcium, but if the cheese body is perfectly closed, no openings whatsoever, and you vacuum pack that, that packaging on it so tight, there's no space whatsoever, you might not get any crystals to form. Or if the packaging is really loose, there's a bunch of surface crevices, there's an open body, there's cracks, splits, mechanical openings, you'll get loads and loads of calcium lactate. And I've actually seen it both ways, right? And you know, depending on your, depending on your situation. And there's additives you can add. Uh, calcium gluconate is, I think, uh, calcium gluconate is an additive you can add that will. It's what's called a chelating agent. It, a sodium gluconate, rather. It, it chelates calcium. It rips out the calcium, holds on to it, so it can't form crystals. Or you can adjust your certification regimen. And I've actually seen some retailers. This is funny. I'm not sure the producers would appreciate this. They'll intentionally temperature abuse their cheese. They'll, they'll put it in loose plastic, cool it down, heat it up, cool it down over a course of a couple of days. This will encourage a moisture to weep to the surface. And now you have moisture on the surface. That's again, like the nice little bubble bath for crystals to form. So yeah, depending on your case, you could go either way. Um, just following on from that, would there be a difference in crystals formed in a cloth-bound cheddar as compared to a um, shrink wrap cheddar? Yeah, depending on how they're made. So uh, most cloth-bound cheddars, you won't have the surface moisture and you won't see surface crystals. And I'm not sure in the States, it's very common to add Lactobacillus helveticus to cloth-bound cheddars to give it sort of that sweet note. And in that case, you might start to get tyrosine crystals being formed. So yeah, definitely. Right, now we don't seem to have any more questions there. So I would like to thank you very much, Pat, for um, joining in today to um, present this webinar.